Honorable Chairperson, dignitaries on the dais, invited guests, representatives of press and electronic media, and my dear fellow participants. First of all, I would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to the organizers of GDAS for giving me this opportunity to share some of my ideas on sustainable development. The topic that I have chosen uh, to make a small presentation is uh, cultural perspective of sustainable tribal development. As you know, I am a social anthropologist by training and I have been listening to different presentation for last two days and participants have put forth different perspective of sustainable development like uh, economic perspective, religious perspective, environmental slash ecological perspective. No one has touched upon cultural perspective. And as social anthropologist, I feel that culture is the infrastructure upon which the superstructure is based upon. If you are thinking of sustainable tribal development, it is very important for all of us to understand the social organization, values, ethos, ideology of a tribal community. And if we ignore, then possibly we'll fail and fail miserably. So it is very important for all of us to have that kind of understanding. And uh, for instance, uh, Many times we speak of uh, development at the macro level, but uh, there is a saying, development takes place at the cost of underdevelopment. If you want to develop daily, perpetuate backwardness in a place like Jabalpur, and so on and so forth. So someone has to make a kind of sacrifice on the altar of development. And unfortunately, this sacrifice is being made always by the people who are culturally suppressed, socially oppressed, and economically exploited. Now, it is very important that uh, we should, uh, you know, give due importance uh, to the intangible culture when we are talking about sustainable tribal development. Intangible, which cannot be perceived, which cannot be seen, that is very, very important. I, I would like to give you a small, I would like to narrate you a small story. Once I was in a field and I saw a tribal man, Pengo, and now he was uh, moving around the field, beating his chest, blowing whistle and tequa, taking awkward shape, steps. And I watched him for a while and I asked him, what are you doing? He came back to me with the same question, what are you doing? And then he asked me for the bidi, the local cigarette. I said, okay, when I go back to the village, I will get you a pack of cigarette, local, I'm that the bidi. And he said, see, this is uh, noon time, and I am going to set fire to the dried leaves and twigs fallen on the ground, because he was doing podu cultivation. And see the tall tree, you know, my ancestors are sleeping there. This is noon time. And I was speaking to them in my own language, requesting them to leave the tree for a while, and once the operation is over, I said I would call you back. And being a trained social anthropologist, I got deceived. I mistook him as a mad person. So this intangible aspect of culture, you know, they derive all strength, all motivation from that intangible culture. But when we make equation like cost benefit, benefit analysis, and we do that at macro level, we land up nowhere. Now, again, that cost-benefit analysis, you know, how much of uh, benefit a project will accrue and what are the losses or how much cost the, pay, the project has to pay. When we make this assessment, we make that at macro level. The point here, what is very important, if a person is making sacrifice, in what way he is going to benefit from that project? That is what we call the just cost-benefit analysis. The cost-benefit analysis at the micro level. And if someone will, you know, pay the cost and someone will take the benefit, that is unjust cost-benefit analysis. And we 
anthropologists don't believe in that kind of analysis. And again, like all the time we talk about, uh, you know, new, I mean, what we call heterogenetic project, but orthogenetic project, small project, development from within. I would like to give you an example. You know, in every area you will find some human resource and also some material resource. If you are, you know, interested for any kind of sustainable development, you try to find out a match between the two. For example, Mankadia uh, is a tribe in uh, western part of Orissa where I come from and they are semi-nomadic by nature and they are wonderful rope makers. Now, if you want, and you will also find that plant Acacia, that Murga plant, I don't know the exact botanical name, the raw material for that, uh, you know, rope. So that, raw, that material resource is there, human resource is also there. You try to bring out a match, go for a small project, and that is orthogenetic product. Instead of, you know, teaching them how to go for coffee cultivation or, you know, you know bringing a, any kind of ortho, heterogenetic project, it is always good to, you know, uh, encourage the, that kind of, or you play the role of facilitator, try to find out a linkage between the human resource and material resource available in a region. Again, like in a community, you will find also a lot of cultural resources. We, there is a, you know, technique what we call cultural resource mapping. I don't have time to tell you what it exactly means, but it's very interesting, cultural resource. You go for a cultural resource mapping, you find out what are the cultural resources? Try to make use of that cultural resources in your sustainable development. And I can say you for sure that will pay you the dividend and the result will be always good. And similarly, we talk about participation. And participation, we design project at our own level, thinking that the tribal people are incompetent. But uh, we, at the level of implementing a project, they are called upon to participate. Here. It's not real participation. If you want to involve them, involve them from the very beginning. Go for a needs assessment, make a prioritization of the need, and help them to develop a project so that they will sense up, they will develop a sense of belonging next to the project. And then that will be the real project. And here we just you know, formulate the project at our own level. And when we go for implementation, we invite them to participate. I can give you 1,001 example, like how human factors are also Im important. We expect their participation, and but are they aware of your project, number one? If they are aware, what kind of perception do they have about the project? Are they sufficiently motivated? So awareness, perception, motivation, then only it's a question of participation. But from straight away, we expect participation without touching upon the human aspect. So how culture is very important. And similarly, we try to use uh, new channels for implementing a project. What about the traditional channels? What about the traditional knowledge system? What about the traditional practices? Why can't we use those channels, those practices, those kind of knowledge in sustainable development? And believe me, if you do so, then they will have enough conviction and they will feel that it is our project and the project would be definitely sustainable. And again, I can tell you a lot many examples. When we say that, that the tribe lives in isolation, no. You go to a village, if it is a multicaste, multi-ethnic, sustainable extraction, each production process starts with a ritual and ends up with another ritual. And even the consumption process, for example, Takuhanaspara, I would like to give, allow me two, three minutes. <laughs> okay? Yeah. So, for, inst for instance, Takuhanaspara, unless until the Pengo performs the Takuhana Parabs, they will not eat the mango kernel. And the mango kernel, white portion will be taken out, and that will be grinded, and then that will be tied in a thin cloth, put under stream water so that the bitterness will go. And again, it is dried under sunlight, and they put it in a pitcher with some dried chili. And when there is a food crisis, they take out this powder, add butter to that, and prepare. It's a kind of well, and then they prepare pancake. And that is how they ma manage the food crisis. And there was a hue and cry that uh, people died by eating mango kernel. And two kg rice, when state government, corporate sector, go to the tribal area, make intervention with best interest. I don't say that their, their intention is bad, 
but it destabilizes the cultural regulator. And when the cultural regulator has destabilized, there is a collapse in the system. And what happened when the two kg rice was supplied? So they didn't process the mango kernel up soon after the Kakuhanas parab. They put the mango kernel under cut in a dark room. So fungus developed. By the time they consumed the two kilo rice and when they took out the this uh, I mean kernel, mango kernel, it had fungus. And by eating fungus in the mango kernel, they died. They have been eating mango kernel for centuries together. They didn't die just because you know they ate mango kernel. But this is the government went there with a the good intention of helping them by supplying two kilo rice, but people died. So this is why the culture is very sensitive. Cultural regulations are very important. I, I will just give one more example and then conclude my speech because already I am late. Me Mehul has given me, Dr. Professor Chohan has given me seven minutes time. So I, I would like to give another example. You know, it's relating to housing project among Didai. Didai people and the houses were constructed and the, the Didai people were forced by those quarters. Again, on a fine morning, all of them left. They said, and uh, one anthropologist was, you know, uh, asked to be careful, to investigate the matter. And he came forward with a very interesting explanation. In the Didai house, you'll find the central pole. And the central Merkunti, they put a burning light after sunset. And the doors and windows are smaller size. So those people who are under charge of construction didn't realize. So they said that, oh, why, why don't you keep big doors and windows? Because after sunset, ghost will enter to the house. And that is why burning lamp is required. Why don't you keep big doors and windows? Because after sunset, ghost will enter to the house. And that is why burning lamp is required. Okay, see the, see the perception. And then what happened? Now, because people didn't find a central pole, they rejected the entire housing club. We involved them at the time of implementing a project, not at the level of formulating a project. I have not many examples to share, but what I say that could there be a cultural perspective of sustainable tribal development? Please think.